Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ah, good. Some people hear me. We're going to try to get this thing started a little bit earlier because there is a lot of information to pass this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are planning to go to uh, DEF CON tomorrow, you will need your badge for today plus the ticket for DEF CON. As well. I'd like to say is for Black Hat, we're trying a feedback system on trying to find out what you feel about the conference this year. On your badge, one of the sections has an ID and a password. If you would use that to log into the system to answer the question so we can see how to pre improve the conference, we would appreciate you making that effort. For some of you, maybe you want to try to hack the site, but you know, please answer the questions. Right now, it's a distinct pleasure to highlight one of our uh, sponsors, Information Security Magazine. They've been supporting us for several years in our efforts to make this event a world-class event difficult to highlight their mission, but we've all benefited from their ability to present us with timely delivery of security relevant information. There are which have been written by world class authors are comprehensive and informative. They're well received by the technical workforce in making informed decisions. Their annual buying guide has helped us to make better choices as well as highlighted new technologies. Their vision has caused their magazine to be indeed be a reference for us all. In fact, a major reason we have grown and matured as a conference was with Information Security Magazine support. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Larry Walsh, the managing editor of Information Security Magazine. His earlier career, he was in the military doing uh, computer security, military security. Then he went and became a real journalist, and now he's back into the fold. Come on down. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, on behalf of Information Security Magazine, I want to welcome you all here today for this luncheon. And um, I hope you'll forgive me, because if I uh, screw up here today, I'm not actually a speaker. I'm a writer, so I do better in print. Um, one of the things that keeps me coming back to Black Hat and keeps the magazine coming back here is that it's an opportunity. Ooh, it's an opportunity for us to interact with real people, real practitioners, and innovators who are really addressing the problems that we face every day in security. And one of the things that, when they asked me to introduce our keynote speaker today, Jeff Jonas. Um, and in reading up about him and meeting him, I was really impressed that he is one of those innovators. Jeff Jonas is president and founder of Systems Research and Development and collaborates with senior management to design and develop strategic information systems. His organization de uh, designs and implements leading edge technology solutions. And as he describes that he has no, uh, no specialty other than inventing that which does not already exist. He is, uh, he's been significantly involved in more than 50 major system development projects and has been profiled in several media outlets. He is uh, currently applying non-obvious relationship awareness to catching and identifying terrorists. It is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Jonas. Good afternoon. Here's what I've got in store for you today. We can get the uh, charts up on the screen, thank you. I've got uh, one slide on my company, just so you guys can figure out where I'm coming from. I've got a series of charts to show you uh, some stuff that is uh, cops and robbers Las Vegas style. I'm going to show you some actual videos that you likely have not seen about how uh, people have been opportunizing on the gaming industry. And then I'm going to take you into this technology called non-obvious relationship awareness. And then I'll show you some case studies on the NORAC technology. In the back, can you guys hear me? Okay, very good. I started the company in 1983, and I moved it to Las Vegas in 1992. I love the heat. I used to be 6'2". Just look at me. I'm actually only 24. Um, the technology called NOR that we created was funded by a venture capital arm of CIA called InQtel. They've given us two rounds. You'll, uh, some of our more recent work and scalability is related to some of that funding. 
The creations of our company get featured in a variety of uh, very public and uh, visible media. And two of the most visible things that we've done, if you've ever seen the Discovery Channel or the Learning Channel or MSNBC where they show those cheating Las Vegas shows, where the surveillance cameras zoom in on the face of the cheater, uh, we took the Visionics facial recognition algorithms and created facial recognition encrypted biometrics over the internet to deploy that for gaming worldwide. And we also created uh, what may be one of the largest data warehouses around 4,200 different systems feeding a central data warehouse every day, never offline, uh, and today has over 125 million people that it is uh, gathering marketing data on. Okay, this is where I teach you how to uh, make a little more money while you're here in Vegas. Just about everything I show you will get you arrested. I would encourage you all to leave a little money. As a resident of Las Vegas, I'd like to point out we don't have any state sales tax, and that's because nice folks like you. <coughs> this device here is called a mini light. If you're sitting close, I'm holding up a, a real one. The, the rogue, uh, in a rogue lab, a group has discovered that there is a vulnerability in one of the, in, in the slot machines, certain brands. There is a photoelectric eye that counts the coins as they fall. So this device here, there's a little button on the end. Down here is a button, and up here is a little light. When inserted into a slot machine, it defeats the photoelectric eye. So you play the game and you get one cherry, which is supposed to pay you two coins if you've been practicing. And with a mini light installed, it defeats, defeating the photoelectric eye, all of the coins fall out of the machine. Completely nonstop. They cost $5 to build, they're being sold for 10,000. The more sophisticated devices, yeah, there's an opportunity for you. This is like a workshop. <clears throat> the more sophisticated devices are remote control, so they get mounted in the machine and there's no button. Somebody sits down, they just tell them to play and collect the money. So I'm gonna show you a real video here. Uh, these two guys right here, they work together, they've been practicing. This is medium grade skill I'm about to show you. The low grade skill goes something like this, and this tells you what the scam's about. If you can see me, the low grade skill, you get these two ladies, I've seen this video, they both get their cards on blackjack, they look at each other's cards, they trade cards so they both have the best possible hands, and then they both put their cards up. This is only medium grade skill. So watch this video, and I'm gonna direct you so I don't have to show it over and over, but I want you to watch this guy's hand right there. He is going to palm the card off the table. He palmed it. He's already traded it, but he just leans out. And now he's gonna palm it back up. They just swapped cards. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it to you one more time. So we can call this a training luncheon. So watch this guy's hand right here. He's gonna palm one of the cards off. Right there, he leans that way and trains cards, and he's gonna put it back up. Medium grade skill. There's a couple of other tells if we went through it some more. <clears throat> Another group, a Pacific Rim team, discovered that when the new $100 bills came out, and the new, they put new bill validators in the, in the uh, slot machines, there's a certain defect between one bill validator and one kind of slot machine. A, a wonderful defect, in fact. Cost a local strip casino one point, I think, two million dollars over a period of two weeks. Good pay. Here's what happens. When the machine's in a certain state, you put the hundred dollar bill in, you push a button, it kicks the hundred dollar bill back out and gives you a hundred in credit. You like that? So you're gonna take your $100 bill and it goes a long ways. <laughs> they actually discovered that in accounting because they, they found that they weren't making any money on a whole bank of slot machines. They did after the fact video analysis to see what was actually happening and the machines were a very good payout. There's another scam called pass posting. Uh, this is on roulette. Pass posting means you wait till the ball falls, so you see what number it's on, and then you put your bet on that number. Usually you use distraction teams. Uh, I'll probably give you an example in a little bit of where there wasn't a distraction team and there was some collusion. Okay. We have an expert over there who's trying to give you some additional training. Blackjacks, but blackjacks pay the player one and a half to one. One and a half to a dollar. So in the surveillance rooms where I get to hang out from time to time, this is very easy to detect because what happens is it's called bet variation. You get somebody going $5, $5, $5, $5, $2,000, $2,000, $2,000. 
And you're in the surveillance room and you're counting down the deck with them. The surveillance guys are, and as soon as the deck goes to plus six, they're betting more. So nobody gets away with that anymore. But they've become a little more sophisticated. They send in five card counters to sit at the ends of the table. And they're playing minimum bet over here, five bucks a hand. So as soon as the deck is hot, somebody just walks up and they're, they only are playing $2,000 a hand. Much harder to detect. Okay, what about this? No big bets. This cost Sun City, South Africa, $2.4 million. Never saw the money leave the table. It is called a chip cup. It is hollow. If you're sitting really close, you can see I have a rendition of one up here. They get packed up full of hundreds. They look like fives. So the eye in the sky and uh, the, the pit bosses only see stacks of fives moving around. There's $400 packed inside. I have a video here that will show you this. That there is a chip cup. If the color was better, it would be, you would notice it to be red. The dealer is going to pick that up and stick it on the tray with the black chips. He's gonna put the red chips on the black chip tray. So those are all black chips and those on the tip are red chips. And they've just been packed with four blacks and now $400 moves back across the table. Obviously the dealer's in on this puppy. <clears throat> okay, this is what happens. This scam here costs a casino a quarter of a million dollars, happens in 15 minutes. This, uh, the dealer's in on this, and he's, they have not rehearsed. If you were to watch this closely over and over, you'd see that it's a little bit clumsy. Everybody on the table's in on it. This, this is police uh, photos. He has three lithium batteries on his back and an antenna system. The focus device is in or in his shoes, and that, that was a nasty picture, so I excluded it. The antenna broadcasts to a van that has the satellite dish in it. They have this video equipment in the van. They are slowing down the video from the camera on the game and then radioing the player with what the next card is. What you get is the clairvoyant on the game. They got a 17 and they're going, I'm feeling lucky, hit me. And they get a four every time. This is simulated to show you how this works. There is a shuffle machine that's got a small little hole in the corner of it and it's too dark to see in that hole, but, and the cards fall too fast. If I can get it to fire up here. So, the infrared light illuminates it and the other camera is, takes the video through that little hole. And in the van, they slow down the video to see what the sequence of the cards are. And then they radio the player to tell them what they are. It was a Las Vegas casino hit for, uh, I think, 1.2 million last, two years ago. And they had a clairvoyant on the game. They had no watch, short sleeve shirt, but it looked like he was always pointing his hand at the shuffle device. The rumor on the street in the surveillance intelligence community where I hang out a bit was, oh no, they finally did it. It was a Japanese team. Uh, they did it, it's a, it's a bio cam with hypoallergenic tubing. They spent two weeks kind of convulsing about the cost that that's gonna be to the industry until they find these people who have this tubing in them. It turned out to be something else. These, uh, these folks that opportunize on the gaming industry have become very organized. They're sharing vulnerabilities on the internet. Not just which casino or which shift, but down to which dealer. They went around and studied every single dealer in the state and found 12 dealers that had a, if you will, genetic defect in the deal, where in a handheld blackjack game, I know you can't see me in the back, but I try to appreciate this, the first card goes face up, and the dealer, when he puts the second card underneath, there were 12 dealers that rotate their wrist too much. They just can't help it. And when you rotate your wrist too much, you can see the whole card, which gives the player a tremendous advantage. That's tip number two. <laughs> Um, in these chat rooms, level one chat rooms, anybody can join. Level two, they do a background check on you. Level three, they do a background check and you commit a felonious act with them. If you're down $100,000, you call your area manager and you get another $100,000 from them and you get back in there. Well, the last line of defense in the gaming industry is their surveillance rooms. They look something like this. While they have thousands of cameras, they don't have that many TVs. You have to pick which TV you're gonna look at or which person or which camera you wanna observe. So you end up staring at people's heads like this, trying to figure out if this person's doing something bad. So one of our customers is Griffin Investigations. They do the surveillance intelligence for the gaming industry. And in the old days, they had these big mug books, three or four books with all these mug shots. So you have somebody down there with 80,000 going, I guess I got lucky. 
and you're trying to figure out if they were getting lucky or not, and in the surveillance room they're flipping through mug books one page at a time, and about three weeks later they think maybe they might have missed it and they can start back at the beginning and do it again. They're gone. So one of the things that we did, uh, we put together this browser-based system. You can't really see this, but uh, one of the first features here is what they would do is they would say we have a white male, uh, 50 years old, plus or minus five years, approximately 150 pounds, plus or minus 15 pounds, uh, doing something on roulette, maybe involving past posting, and what gets produced is a list of these people for them to maybe take a further look at to see who's been doing this, okay? So then about three years ago, we implemented the Visionics facial recognition algorithms. So then they take the guy's mug, they align the eyes, and that's a real shot of a real guy, and it happened to have been this guy here who ranked top 10, scored a 7.24 on facial features. And from there, they pull up his file. This particular guy has, say, 30 different AKAs, six different social security numbers, five different date of births, on this side here are the different intelligence reports that have been produced on them, and the gaming, these gaming uh, surveillance rooms, they click on these intelligence reports and it tells you who they've been associated with, what their scams are, um, where they travel, and then they click through these pictures and see all these different disguises, and you'd be quite impressed with the, the level of disguise that these folks uh, employ. So for the gaming industry, much like many businesses, they have to try to protect themselves, so you have policies and procedures, hiring standards, you do background checks, employee training, and yada yada. But as soon as you have somebody on the inside, it gets really, really expensive. And nothing's more expensive than an executive on the inside. So a line level person, a staffer on the inside will cost you one X, an executive on the inside will cost you 16 times that. I've got two examples of really, really bad insiders for you. One is, if you remember the McDonald's uh, Monopoly sweepstakes, well, the corporate security guy to his friends and family was giving all the awards away, and Simon Marketing is the company that held the McDonald's account. They virtually lost their company. They lost over 90% of their stock value. Actually, that's nothing these days. <laughs> it's looking pretty good. And I think the worst insider ever is uh, this, this bloke. Um, Robert Hansen, which cost a lot of lives and exposed a lot of U.S. programs and created a lot of vulnerabilities for the U.S., but he had access to way too many things, clearly an executive, and that's pretty nasty. So the gaming industry uh, very much wants to keep the insiders out as well. The background on this technology that I've created specifically for this problem of finding connections between people is called NORA. It stands for Non-Obvious Relationship Awareness. I originally created it in the early 80s. People were going to the hospital, spending the night, and eating a meal for free because they would, on their admission papers, use their middle name and change one or two digits in their social security number, and it would never merge up onto their credit file, and you'd never collect the money. So then in the um, mid-90s, the, the, the Las Vegas and uh, other uh, gaming locations came to me and asked me to solve this problem. They had 18 different lists of bad guys. There's something called a black book here, for example. If a, one of these gaming companies transacts with these people, they will lose their gaming license. So every day they're trying to evaluate off these 18 lists if any of these people are transacting with them. And what we created is we took all 18 lists and every day compared everybody from all their different systems across all their different properties against all those lists. And every morning churned out um, leads that would find connections between people. I'm gonna give you some examples of that. Uh, in, in 2000, we started using this technology elsewhere in corporate America to flush out more bad guys and insiders. I'll give you some examples of that. And then post-September 11th, we started working with the FBI watch list in conjunction with corporate America data sets and started finding connections between the watch list and people who had been transacting or making reservations in the past or in the future and finding some connections that otherwise would not have been found. The, just in summary, the capability you're going to see is what NORA does is ingest data from hundreds or thousands of data sources. We find both the obvious and the non-obvious connections between people. We generate leads in the form of alerts, so it doesn't tell you who to shoot, but it, it's like a smoke detector, so it tells you where to focus investigative resources. It is really a critical activity if you're going to do transaction pattern analysis. If you're doing anti-money laundering, for example, and you think you have five different people, 
and each of them have five different transactions, that is a very different study than if it really is true that it's one person with 25 transactions. And what Nora does, it does person resolution. It's figuring out when people that look different are really the same. And my work in this field, while it's been going on for some time, I've set six my engineers on resolving the problem in the last three years to do this all in real time, within a second or two or three from large data sources to find these connections. And if you were to fuse the data, it looks something like this. Now, on the left side are good guys, the right side are bad guys, and the reason you fuse the good guys to the bad guys is because your good guys are trusted and you're trying to find connections between good guys and bad guys. And as that diagram there kind of suggests, we find a zillion connections between people, but it's the red lines that are the ones that are really scary. So if you can't focus into which relationships are bad, you get too many false positives and you produce useless results. A major part of the story is data quality. As I mentioned earlier, our largest deployment of this kind of an architecture, of those boxes across the top, I have a customer with 4,200 daily feeds with what might be estimated to be a half a million people punching in data behind all of those 4,200 systems. So how do you actually get a good result doing something like this? And the major part of the story is, is data quality. So one of the things that we do is we have name roots. So we know that Dick, Dickie, Richie, Ricardo roll up to a Richard Root name. Mohammed, which was on the FBI watch list, can have two M's or one, an A or an E. You can't have a human sitting there trying to play with every variation when they're not familiar with those languages. And we went on and did this for about uh, 40 languages here. And then there's address standardization. So we interface with uh, tables that are updated from the US Postal Service every two weeks and other postal services from other countries. So if the address that's been provided is Oak Street, but it's really South Oak Avenue and the zip is transposed, you fix that first. If somebody's misspelled Cimarron, you fix that. Then you do data quality on things like phone numbers and social security numbers. You strip weird symbols that happen to show up in this messed up data. And then you validate values. The first two values here are incomplete or invalid. The third one is insidious, 800-555-1212. Every Bill Smith at that number is not the same guy. You can't solve for this, you lose. If you uh, look at um, hotel reservation data, for example, you find that a lot of phone numbers are actually travel agency phone numbers. So what we figured out how to do is have it in real time detect generic values and discount them. Otherwise, when you get to about 8 million people in the epicenter of one of these person resolution databases, the performance goes crunch. One of the other things that we do, which is really, really necessary to solve this problem, is we keep every variation of every name they have ever used. And we keep every address that has ever been used and every number. Every phone number, credit card, driver's license, frequent flyer number, you name it, any number that gets presented gets used. Now I'd like to point out, at, you know, when I first gave a presentation like this in Washington at the NISSC, afterwards I was told that I was the target. I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but there was an impression that maybe I had a lot of data. And I thought this would be a good time to tell this group, I don't have any data. <laughs> this is just a product, something I invented and it gets plugged in. So let's, I just wanted to make that clear. <coughs> I'm not the target. We also keep relationships. So if you're looking for insiders, this is golden. Off of employment applications and in human resources systems, you find spouses and emergency contacts and references off of employment applications. It would shock you to find the number of connections that you find. This is like, you know, when you fill out your employment application and ask for references, you ask yourself the question, who do I trust most? Who would lie for me if they were mad? Who? And that's who you put down. Later, when somebody wants to find somebody on the outside to help them take advantage of something on the inside, they ask themselves basically the same question. So we find some really, really interesting connections there. And the way this kind of works is when a record shows up to the database, to this NORA processing, the first thing we do, let's say an applicant shows up with this information, first thing we do is go against the database of X tens or 100 million people and we produce a short list. So this would be everybody that it could be. So this is now two people, 20, 200, 2,000, but not 80 million. That hits the database engine. The rest that I'm gonna talk about is all, all done in memory, which gives you very high degrees of scalability, if you care. The second thing you do is confidence evaluation. So now you're taking this inbound record and you're comparing it to this very short list you've culled out of this 80 million data set. And here, we look for things like this. If you see two Jeff Jonases at the same address, you might think they're the same guy. 
You look a little further, you notice the date of births are different. You go, oh, it's a junior, senior. They know each other, they're related, not the same guy. Then you look further than that and say, wait a minute, only the month and day are transposed. Same guy. That's confidence evaluation. So out of confidence evaluation, you get two things. You get matches, these people are the same, and you get relationships, which are these people just know each other. So the aspect of person resolution is trying to figure out really, really quick when two people are the same. So here you've got an applicant and you have somebody who was previously arrested. Look at the differences between these records. Robert I. Ashley versus Bob Ashley Jr., 1024 Mexcal versus Mezcal Way. The social security numbers are different, 1324 versus 1334, and the phones are entirely different. So the importance here is to be able to resolve these with high confidence in real time against very, very large data sets, and that's where a lot of our research has been. And it turns out when you figure out who's the same as who, there are a lot of interesting leftovers in memory about all the people that were very closely connected. And that's where Nora picks up all these connections to produce a capability that we call degrees of separation, which basically means the DEA agents, college roommates, ex-wife's current husband is the drug lord. Let me go through that again. The DEA agents, college roommates, ex-wife's current husband is the drug lord. So here, is one cell, there's a number of neutrals with one good guy being a green, and here's another cell that's been established of different people as the different boxes and connections between them and the red one being a bad guy. And later, when you find a passport application that has the same address and you connect B and E, you find it six degrees of separation, there's a connection. We are, with a database of 10 million relationships, we're able to test up to 30 degrees of separation at a speed of up to 100 branches a second. Now, I spoke at a federal conference on emerging technologies, and of course somebody stood up and said, yeah, but everybody's related within six. So at 30 degrees, I'm related to bin Laden. What do you say about that? And the answer, which came to me suddenly was, okay, everybody, you heard him. Get him! <laughs> I thought I'd answer that now. There's, in very, very large data sets, there's little reason to go more than two to three degrees deep. In very small data sets, less than a million, all bad guys, up to 30 gives you some very interesting capabilities to connect cells. So I'll just leave it at that is why there'd be some practical application to 30. Again, my work has been in doing this as perpetual analytics in real time as fast as data is changing in the system. There's one scam where you have an accounts payable manager changes the vendor's name and address 10 minutes before checks get run. The check goes, oh, this is another training tip for you. Follow this closely. You go into the account payable system and you change the vendor's name and address to be yours or your sister's or your neighbor's. And as soon as checks get finished getting printed 10 minutes later is you change it back. That is very, very hard to detect. Well, in this world, as fast as it changes in the accounts payable system, it makes its way through Nora and people today are enjoying little beeps on their beepers within eight seconds that tell them that there's been a new relationship that's been discovered across their enterprise that they can do something about. So it's a form of perpetual analytics. <clears throat> well, let me show you some of the goodies that we found. I don't think I've named any specific companies, which is good. This is a Las Vegas casino. <clears throat> we did a batch run for them, not a real time, you know, run it for a year. But it just gives you a snapshot of what you find out of the gate. They gave us 20,000 or more employees, all their vendors, all their players, everybody they'd ever arrested, and the Griffin database of those professional card counters and or cheaters. What did we find? <clears throat> we found 24 players who were professional cheaters. These professional cheaters don't play for fun. They were flying them back in to try to get on the plus side of this transaction with them when all they do for a living is cheat. We found 23 players with relationships to people they'd previously arrested. 12 employees of their own employees were the player. Very unusual. 192 employees had possible vendor relationships, and seven of their own employees didn't know the vendor. No, no, these seven employees were the vendor. It's another training tip for you. <laughs> we uh, did some work for a federal agency. They gave us over 20,000 employees, over 75,000 vendors. Uh, we entered in and they gave us uh, a list of names from a data source one that they just called very evil people. And they gave us another data source of another 200,000 people they called very much more, more evil people. Between Monday at 11.30 and end of Wednesday, we ground this stuff through Nora. 
We found 140 employees related to vendors, possibly related to vendors, I should say. And we could have done a second pass and called this down, so it's not like it's pure trauma here. I just want to warn you about that. We found 1,451 vendors possibly related to these bad guys. When I briefed their management on this, they just stopped looking at me. They looked at each other. The idea of people installing the phones in the Coke machines or on the bad guy list was a bad thing. 253 employees possibly related to bad guys. And again, two vendors were the bad guy. And N was not zero, but a certain number of the employees were the bad guy or were the vendor. For a large retailer, place you all shop, we took over 800,000 employees, all of their vendors, including up to eight different addresses, bill to, ship to, remit to, and everybody that ever arrested. What do we find? 564 employees with a possible vendor or criminal relationship and 26 more employees who figured out how to be the vendor. So th then we did this thing for the Food Marketing Institute surrounding a problem we have in this country called organized retail theft. Turns out there's a big difference between onesie twosie little shoplifting and highly organized rings that are targeting certain products. In fact, they have warehouses as big as Walmart warehouses where they stage this stuff. In fact, infant formula is one of their targeted items because of its value. In fact, when they put it in these warehouses and it expires, are they good citizens and feed it to the cows? No! They bring in the counterfeiters who strip the labels off with new expiration dates and put on new labels with new expiration dates. Feeding expired infant formula to kids. It's estimated to be organized retail theft, which goes up to razor blades, um, infant formula, and batteries and film, things like that. It's estimated to be a, a $20 billion a year problem. They've only ever caught two rings. So how do you find them? So we were asked to do a study to, to look into this. So the Food Marketing Institute, which represents a huge chunk of our economy as an association of retailers, gave us uh, from three sources, three different large chains, all their rest data, 80,000 records of arrested information. Now what we did is we run it through NOR to figure out who's the same as who, and then you sort by address. And here's what we find. In summary, I will tell you that we found 960 addresses in the U.S. that were shared criminal facilities where more than one person was stealing on more than one day across more than one location. In fact, we found 13 locations that had six or more people. 19 with five, 31 with four, blah, 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 blah. So the number one item that we found happened to be this, a location at Ward's Island. 45 people, the same address, very small dollars. Turns out that it is a, um, a men's halfway house kind of thing. Organized crime, training center, probably not. The 12th item on the list is likely a Fagan operation, as in an Oliver Twist Fagan, as in somebody that is an adult who's commanding the children. If you can see in the back, maybe you can't, but over here, the ages. Hmm. Well, on the, right, on, the, on the right side of that screen, the ages are, there's many, many teenagers. There are six kids. They are targeting one very popular brand of jeans, and that's all they do, and they're even provided room and board. And I've seen some of the surveillance footage of the house, and they were literally running an operation, bringing kids in and getting them to steal, and then they get repackaged into boxes with other of the same brands of jeans and sold right back to the stores where they're stealing them from. So relationship awareness, which is what the NORA does, tends to find, find things like these. You find employees who have trained their friends to commit fraud. So there, we had somebody that was a markdown specialist. So they're the ones that put the red line through and mark it down, put the markdown prices in the stores, trains their roommate how to do it, and their roommate goes and employs that training technique at every other store except hers. You have purchasing managers connected to vendors. In fact, we found people very, very, in, very high in senior management connected to vendors. In fact, in one case, and this just proves the point that we just produced leads, we find somebody very high in the company connected to uh, a vendor, and they go back and pull the disclosure statements from senior management. They've been collecting them for eight years on conflict of interest disclosures, and they actually had a disclosure that was already named. It was the first time they ever even asked to use any of their disclosure statements, and it was all above boards. We find employees living with people that you've been arresting. That is always a shocker. We find that in every case. Uh, slip and fall victims where the security guard, who is the witness and explained how horrible it was and that there was water at the time, is related to the, the person that had the slip and fall, like the emer through emergency contact information, stuff like that. New credit accounts that are virtually identical to the ones you're writing off. You shut down one credit account, somebody else just opens up another one. 
job applicants you've already arrested. We've done some studies here where you take in the people that you're trying to hire or have hired and find out they've been ripping you off for years and you just never figured it out. New vendors, front operations for revoked vendors. Uh, there are big reasons why our retailers do not want to buy from um, child sweatshops in China. And when you find them, they get shut down. And the very next day, there's a whole new company selling the exact same product from the same city. Different company name, different address, and maybe the only thing that connects them is the fax number. So we look for things like that. And shoplifters being part of larger organized retail theft rings. So what I've shown you is how we've taken this technology called Nora, we've adapted it to the gaming industry to go after catching bad guys. And then post September 11th, uh, it, it was used to use to find other very, very interesting things that had immediate importance to national law enforcement. So it's kind of an exciting day to uh, you know take yourself in at the end of the night and go, wow, I think we caught somebody. So with that, thank you all for coming. Have fun in Las Vegas and leave some money here.